teams of nationalist saboteurs trained by the Germans. By 6 a.m., the whole frontier zone from East Prussia to the Carpathians was engulfed in one gigantic battle. However, it was in the center, in Belorussia, where half of all Germany's mechanized units were in action, that the most crucial battles of the opening phase were about to take place. Opposite the German army group center were four Soviet armies. The 10th, 3rd and 4th of the West Front and the 11th Army of the Northwest Front. The Russians occupied a salient which jutted into German territory, its center at Bialystok. Beyond Bialystok was Minsk, a key rail junction and guardian of the main highway to Moscow. To the north, Panzer Group 3 smashed through at the junction between the two Soviet fronts and crossed the river Neman. Panzer Group 2 forced the river Bug and by the second day had penetrated 40 miles into Soviet territory. With the Panzers racing forward on the outside, 4th and 9th infantry armies cut into the salient with pincer movements squeezing between them the Russian armies around Bialystok. The Panzer's objective was to meet at Minsk and prevent any Russian withdrawal. As the German spearheads sliced through the Soviet frontier armies, Moscow failed completely to grasp the dimensions of the catastrophe which had befallen Russia. On the evening of the first day, the defense commissar, Marshal Timoshenko, had ordered all three Soviet fronts to mount a general counter-offensive and sweep the enemy from Soviet territory. Timoshenko's order was a fantasy. The Soviet reserve was not yet fully mobilized and there was no operational plan. All General Pavlov, commander of the key West Front could do, was turned for inspiration to war games played the previous January. With control and communications in the frontline areas almost completely broken down, with fuel and ammunition dumps burning and the German Air Force in control of the skies, the attacks were doomed from the start. On June the 27th, five days after the invasion, the armoured jaws of Guderian's Panzer Group II and Hoth's Panzer Group III closed near Minsk. 200 miles into the Soviet Union and a third of the way to Moscow. It was a stunning achievement. In the vast pocket that had been created around Bialystok and Minsk, 32 Soviet infantry and eight tank divisions were facing annihilation. While Army Group Center was smashing its way into the Soviet West Front, Army Group North had thrown its 600 tanks at the junction of the Soviet 8th and 11th Armies of the Northwest Front. The German spearheads were the 41st and 56th Panzer Corps of Panzer Group 4. Their objectives were to cross the rivers Niemann and Dvina, the most difficult natural obstacles in front of Army Group North. On the first day of the attack, the armoured spearheads crossed the Niemann 
and penetrated 50 miles. Near Rossanie, on the second day, 41st Panzer was counter-attacked by 300 tanks of the Soviet 12th and 3rd Mechanized Corps. It took four days for the Germans to encircle and destroy the Russian force. Meanwhile, 56th Panzer Corps dashed for the River Davina and in a remarkable coup, seized bridges at Davinsk intact. After the seizure of the Davina bridges and the fall of Davinsk, the leading formations of 56th Panzer Corps furiously set about enlarging the bridgehead. A priceless opportunity now offered itself. An immediate drive forwards would make it almost impossible for the Soviets to defend Leningrad. However, it was not to be. Orders, received with disbelief by the tankmen, were to wait for the infantry to arrive. In the end, the wait would last almost a week. While German operations in the north and in the centre had produced dramatic advances, in the south, the invasion forces attacked a sector whose commanders had woken up quickly to the German threat and whose tank forces vastly outnumbered the panzers. From the start, the invaders faced a determined resistance. On the German side, the left wing of Army Group South was made up of the 17th and 6th armies, along with one panzer group, the 1st. Opposite stood the Soviet 5th, 6th and 26th armies. While German infantry struck at the junctions between Russian formations, Panzer Group 1 drove its armoured spearhead of 600 tanks towards the town of Brody. On June the 26th, five Soviet mechanized corps with over a thousand tanks mounted massive counter-attacks from north and south. The aim was to cut through the flanks of Panzer Group 1 and meet near Dubno. The battle between Panzer Group 1 and the massed armor of the Soviet Southwestern Front was one of the fiercest of the whole invasion, lasting a full four days. The Russians fought furiously, and crews of German tanks and anti-tank guns found to their horror that the new Soviet T-34s and heavy KVs were almost immune to their weapons. However, the tanks were seldom handled well or concentrated into powerful groups. They could be isolated and after they had been immobilized by blowing off their tracks, they could be destroyed at close quarters. Meanwhile, the Luftwaffe was ranging freely over the battlefield, smashing Russian armour wherever it was found. The Soviet armoured pincers failed to meet at Dubno. Although Panzer Group 1 took a severe battering in the battles around Dubno, it survived the confrontation still capable of operations. The Soviets did not. The last substantial tank forces in the south had been used up, consumed in the inferno. Oh. 